Welcome back to the Edgeverse Enigma podcast. This week, we're chatting with special guest Tony Bevilacqua, the CEO and founder of Cognitive 3D. This episode, we'll be diving into data privacy and ownership, the evolution of Cognitive 3D, and VR in education. You won't want to miss it. Welcome back to the Edgeverse Enigma podcast. I've got a very exciting guest today, someone who I would say is building uh, one of the key pillars of what uh, XR needs as things move forward and things evolve, especially in the education space. So really excited to have Tony Bevilacqua from Cognitive 3D on our podcast today. Uh, Tony, thank you for coming on. Thanks for having me, Evan. For sure, for sure. Uh, I always like to start off with whereabouts are you located right now? In, in Yeah. So I'm in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, so I actually uh, founded the startup here uh, back in 2015 and pretty uh, decent place to build a company to, you know, over uh, some of the other markets. It is a nice spot. One of our employees, he's out in, in BC, he's usually up in Surrey, but he's always sharing okay. photos from around BC and I am jealous. Very jealous. For sure. Where are you based again, Evan? Do you remind me? Yeah, based out of uh, Kitchener Waterloo at the moment. Uh, awesome. So, obviously, I quickly said that you're from Cognitive 3D. Um, you're the CEO there, but uh, for the audience and those who don't know, who is Tony Bevilacqua and what is Cognitive 3D? Yeah, for sure. So, I'm the founder and CEO of Cognitive 3D. We focus on um, analytics for virtual, augmented, and mixed reality. Uh, what that means is we collect behavioral data on how people are interacting in 3D space. Um, just a quick background on myself. I've been at this since 2015. I'm actually a second time founder. So I ran a company prior to this, um, primarily in the mobile analytics space. Um, and we were building a product primarily for like games and consumer facing apps, but more on a mobile mindset. So you're thinking kind of like a competitor to Mixpanel or Flurry or, you know, something in that category. Uh, and through building that company, I was a chief product officer. Uh, went out to GDC for a few years and kind of got early exposure to what was going on with Oculus and and the DK1, DK2, and really see, saw like, um, you know, a real opportunity to build something that was innovative. Um, the product that I had been building at the time at the last startup was very much trying to uh, compete in a... Um, a space with a lot of well-funded incumbents. And, uh, you know, we're really just trying to catch up and get feature parity and, and compete on, on that level. And the reality was in the immersive technology space that there was an opportunity for innovation. And so that's really what caught my interest as a, as a founder and as somebody who likes to build things is there was a true opportunity to actually build something from the ground up and, and look at something uh, from a different perspective. And so the, the thesis that I kind of started the company with was really this, um, you know, idea of using the virtual reality headset as a vehicle for data collection. And then that kind of laid the foundation for the visualizations, the tools we created, the other types of things that ultimately follow. But that's kind of the, the founding story of the company. Uh, we started 2015, uh, first employee 2016. Um, and then from there, we kind of started to, to spin up um, the organization, hire our first employees and uh, build our first product. Um, we did start in the in the gaming and uh, in consumer facing app space. I just like a lot of people thought that the rocket ship was taken off. And uh, reality is, is that there was a lot of work that needed to be done on the headset side. So we made a quick pivot in enterprise and training and simulation has been just a, a bread and butter area for us ever since. Amazing, amazing. And yeah. to, we'll definitely get into the, the VR space and obviously cognitive a lot more. But um, myself being an entrepreneur, I'm curious, what got you into the entrepreneurship space? What made you that first time founder uh, before cognitive? Entrepreneurship runs in my family. Um, so, you know, I think that that is really where uh, that was set in. So um, my dad's side of the family, Italian heritage, um, came to uh, Canada for new opportunity um, ended up, uh, his, uh, my grandfather's father, uh, owned a, um, a grocery store, uh, one of the, the first main street in Vancouver. And, uh, he ended up taking a small piece of that grocery store and built out a small table of, uh, sporting goods and things like that. And he ended up creating, uh, eventually, and this is kind of like at the end of world war two, um, you know, the first, uh, official sporting goods store in Vancouver it was called Abbey sporting goods. 
And uh, he built that from the ground up and, you know, completely constructed his sporting goods store and, you know, was a staple to the community and, and amateur sports kind of uh, throughout the community as well. That got instilled in my dad as well. And he spent a lot of time building small businesses and things like that. And so, you know, I wouldn't say initially I was unemployable. I definitely have had jobs and stuff like that, but I've made myself unemployable. Uh, you know, I feel like the the founding mission is is uh, more in, in my skill set of, of what I want to do and, and where uh, my capabilities lie. Um, so I joined it as a co-founder at my last startup and was the chief product officer there, led engineering. Uh, and then when I founded the startup, I decided to go solo. Amazing, amazing. Yeah. You know, just very interesting and can definitely uh, resonate with the uh, unemployable side of things. I was, uh, myself have been in the space for now six, seven years and yeah, feel uh, it would kind of be hard to go back to the corporate world and looking Probably. at your LinkedIn before this call, I can see you really only have the those two and working for the VRAR association listed there. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and then looking at cognitive 3D, but just before cognitive 3D, you were saying you were at down at GDC and that's kind of where you saw VR for the first time with Oculus. It sounded like, like what was that first experience like and what made you want? Yeah. I, I honestly can't remember what the first content experience was the demo that I did, but I do remember that it was GDC and then also E3 uh, of that year as well were really kind of pinnacles in, in 2015 as well for me. Um, and there was also another one called Vision Summit, and then there was uh, Unity Unite in Boston that year as well. And I went to all of those shows because for me, I was just kind of exploring the space. Like I really, you know, I, I was on a mission already, so I wanted to be sure. And so I started spending some time with the market, with the technology, getting an understanding of like, you know, where where things were in the hype cycle and. Um, you know, Facebook had, uh, you know, was just in the process or had just acquired uh, Oculus, I guess, by then. And uh, really felt like, you know, things were going in, in the right direction. And so, you know, I started to draw like weird stuff on my whiteboard in the in the office of like what it could mean to measure space. You know, like if you think about traditional mobile analytics, it's it's really simple, right? I, I like to kind of talk about this concept of the evolution of metrics, right? And the idea of the evolution of metrics is that in web and mobile, you know, we're measuring very simplistic behavior. We're really trying to measure how somebody moves through a funnel towards a valued goal. And that might be IEP, it might be ad spend, just trying to drive retention rate or duration inside an application, but ultimately is a really specific feedback loop that you're trying to understand and how you can kind of keep people within that loop. And with immersive technology, we kind of have this idea that a user is not really a user. A user is a participant. They are someone who participates within the content. They have the ability to change and, and write their own destiny in terms of how they consume that environment. So it started kind of peeling away the onion. It's like, well, what do I need to do to help a developer understand like what people are doing in a, in a world, like inside of an immersive space? And so that really kind of started, and I, I drew this kind of like half like 180 on my whiteboard. And then I had this path of like a user kind of like, you know, kind of navigating through it. And then I drew like these heat maps and stuff like that of like where the user looked and that sort of thing. And I was calling it like ocular analytics, spatial analytics, like all these different things. I was trying to figure out like, what is the word, you know, like the word map of like what describes this. And, um, you know, I landed on this word cognitive because, you know, it was kind of, you know, the user's perception of reality was a kind of a key piece of all of this and, you know, how somebody cognitively, you know, um, uh, comprehends the world around them. And I, so that's really the process that I had of kind of like from that initial kind of excitement through to trying to turn it into tangible idea and then boiling it down, down to a solution. Such a great story. And I can, I can see if, if you're not watching the video and you're listening to the audio, I can see Tony like picturing it in his mind and <laughs> seeing the whiteboard right in front of you, even that's not there. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Um, and I guess talking about cognitive now, what would you say it's like running a VR company today versus back then when you started it in 2015? Yeah, I mean, it's been a, a real slog. Um, you know, it's it's been a, a difficult journey. And I, you know, you've been in this space for a long time as well. It's at, at the the folks that are here are, you know, here still are, are resilient, you know, and they have really kind of went through the, um, 
you know, the challenges that forming a new space, a new category really entails. And so, you know, I think that, um, you know, that's kudos to everybody that's, you know, kind of still has, has made it. We had to really focus on our customer and what created value for them. And I think that by staying true to that through this whole process, we were able to build our product, but we were also able to stay alive, which honestly was kind of the, the same problem. Um, you know, I, I, I get a lot of investors talk to us and they'll, they'll ask us like, well, who are your competitors? I'm like, well, I, I had a lot, you know, and, and, you know, over the years. Right. And honestly, you know, we had to really make a lot of key bets on what we were going to create, what we were going to build and where we were going to focus. And so I think that those bets were really important for our ultimate survival. And so we had to make a really difficult decision. We had, I think, uh, 500 plus developers or something like that on the platform back in 16. So like way back then, and you know, that was really exciting. It was an exciting time. You know, if you think about how like Flurry came about, they didn't really have a business model. They just wanted to capture the market. So I'm thinking to myself as a new analytics founder in a new category, you know, I just need to capture the market, the money will come. But the reality in this particular space is that we are already kind of on the upswing of the hype cycle and just about to come back down as we started to kind of realize the challenges that exist in this space. And so while we were successful in creating tools and uh, software and solutions and stuff for the developers, they didn't want to pay for Unity, let alone pay for analytics. Like they didn't want to do these things. And so we had to kind of look ourselves in the mirror and we're like, okay, well, you know, what do we, what do we do with this great technology we created? You know, how are we going to survive if we can't get somebody to bankroll this thing? And so what we did realize though, is in those 500 signups that, you know, there was big companies like Accenture and ExxonMobil and others that had signed up for our free product. And so we started to look at that in a little bit more detail and kind of realize that there was a real opportunity in the enterprise category. They were using it to solve real problems. They had innovation budgets and other types of financial instruments that they could pay us and we could kind of um, earn our way through this whole process. And, um, you know, we just kind of had to stay true to where the value proposition was. And, and, you know, from 17 all the way through, we raised very little venture capital and kind of, um, you know, had to operate off the cash that we were able to, um, you know, get value from the platform. Amazing, amazing. Yeah, I can attest to that roller coaster that the past uh, six plus years have been. So, yeah, you're, no, you're you're right on the money there that it has been a, a roller coaster and definitely yeah. you need to be resilient to have lasted to where you are. So kudos to you. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> So to dive deeper in into cognitive, obviously I know what cognitive is and know know about all the features that it has. But curious for for the audience, can you explain what is cognitive three D as a platform? And um, you're talking about Accenture and different companies you're working with there. Any use cases that you can share so that people can kind of visualize um, how it's being used. Yeah, for sure. So Cognitive 3D is a spatial analytics platform. And what that means is we're collecting behavioral data on what people are doing inside the headset. So how are they experiencing the world around them? What captures and keeps, keeps their attention? What are they doing with their hands? How are they interacting with the world? And we boil that down into a few different types of tools that help our customers kind of uh, exert or uh, uh, extract value uh, or answers uh, from um, their tools and uh, or, or their experiences that they've created. Uh, from a technical perspective, we offer both a Unity and Unreal SDK. So if you're building content, right, you created in a scenario or something like that on either of those platforms, you can add Cognitive 3D at the beginning for early UX, early testing, play testing, those types of things. Or you can add us at the end to measure the experience in live operations and kind of see, you know, how it's being uh, interacted with by your employees, your end users, whoever ends up putting on, on the headset. And um, so we've got a kind of few key tools that uh, have really driven the way here. The first one is called Scene Explorer. And so Scene Explorer is uh, effectively what's called an after action review. And uh, after action review, or at least the concept of them, has been around for a long time. It kind of started in the Department of Defense where they wanted to be able to understand pilots and uh, you know, kind of spread into the commercial aircraft industry through simulators and those types of technology as well. Understanding pilots, situational awareness, cockpit, you know, information management, all those different types of things. Um, you could do that really well with simulators. After actual review gave the decision makers, the evaluators, the assessors, the information that they needed to be able to understand fully how this person did. 
And so what we've done is we've created effectively an after action review for any Unity or Unreal simulation. So, you know, now you've got simulation grade or simulator grade analytics tools and assessment tools that you can use for anybody that puts on the headset. And obviously this doesn't have to be an aircraft. It could be an electrical simulation. It could be a forklift simulator. It could be, you know, any of these different types of use cases uh, all the way through to soft skills uh, and a few other things. Um, but, uh, you know, basically whatever you build in the experience, we can measure it, right? The second tool we created was something called objectives. And so the objective system was really this idea that we needed the ability to assess specific behaviors that represented completion, compliance, and competency uh, within an application. And if we really wanted to be able to tap into the immersive technology and be able to understand uh, the full scope of how a user compromises the world, we needed the ability to assess different types of inputs. So instead of just events, which is like a typical mobile, you know, type of paradigm, we can assess gates. We can measure what somebody looks at or how long they looked at something or how long did it take them to look at something and be able to use that as an input to demonstrate something like situational awareness, right? Or the ability for a user to follow a process and procedure uh, within a particular scenario. And so with these kind of like two key tools, these are kind of the ones that make the foundation of that, you know, kind of use case. Uh, we've been able to address a few kind of key, uh, like verticals, I guess you could call them, or e industries maybe. Um, and I'll kind of go through those real quick. So the first one is really in training and simulation. Uh, we've been able to do a lot of work in that category. And, and you know, there's really turnkey value for anybody that works in that category as well. And this encompasses hard skills training, but it can also encompass soft skills training as well. And usually it's verticals, you know, where it's difficult to recreate the experiences. I mean, you, you know, the kind of the criteria here that makes it, you know, uh, valuable to, to build a simulation. Uh, but training and simulation has really been a big category for us. The second is in consumer research. And for us, we break that into three categories. The first one being an AEC, so architecture, engineering, and construction. And so that'll be around uh, pre-visualization of space, uh, building a digital twin. You might be interested in things like wayfinding, signage, uh, maybe even just testing how users interact within that 3D world, how they comprehend the space, that sort of thing. Uh, the second would be a product design, right? So that could be like automotive, um, you know, aircraft, you know, all those types of things where you might want to pre-visualize a particular product or experience before taking it into market. Um, and then the third would be in retail CPG. And so this is like store design, packaging, planograms, those types of elements where you want to be able to understand how a, how a user or consumer uh, might interact with a specific space. Um, the third category is academic research. We've got about 35 customers uh, worldwide right now in the academic research category doing all sorts of work, um, you know, kind of across the board from people that are pursuing a PhD all the way through to, you know, commercial research or even uh, government research and those types of use cases as well. Fantastic. And yeah. with that, with that in mind, and all all those the the features and what the platform offers through Cognitive Three D, you kind of touched on it when you were talking about the the airplane simulators. But why is this data so important for an education sense when you're talking about that that training side of things? Yeah, for sure. As opposed to just kind of like measuring surface level behavior uh, or surface level progression, you do have the ability to understand how a user may comprehend a particular piece of content and how they might, you know, kind of uh, assess a scene as well. And so we typically are assessing above and beyond criteria. We're assessing specific other types of inputs. So you can get into like eye tracking, gaze, biometrics, other types of elements that can attract other, uh, attract, uh, extract other types of markers. Uh, from what's going on within that particular piece of content. The other thing that we do is we make it really simple and really easy for our customers to change the assessment criteria. And so if you're building a piece of content, you could quickly go and change the game, you know, in terms of like what you're going to assess, uh, the types of criteria, and you can use the objective system to develop different hypotheses on how to build a better mousetrap. And so that's kind of the the idea with the tools is to be not just um, provide you the assessment tools with kind of a deep level of understanding of scene context and, you know, end user behavior, uh, but, but also give you the tools to experiment and build better content. Amazing. So you're, yeah, you're not only being able to assess students or trainees better, but you're building for the learning outcomes and making sure it's right properly for those. Amazing. 
and uh, before before recording this podcast, I was doing some research. I was watching you were on the the Robot Spaceship podcast, um, and you were talking about your XR privacy framework and how that's kind of something that you've built to um, set standards ahead of what the industry is doing. Um, I think that's a very important piece of data collection and data with what you're doing. So can you touch on that a little bit as well? Yeah, you got it. Um, you know, so the XR privacy framework, obviously we've been paying attention to privacy for a really long time as a company. And, you know, I wouldn't say it's disheartening, but it's was kind of surprising that we had put so much attention into it, but we hadn't really seen a lot from the industry leaders in terms of, you know, coming up with tools, controls, uh, frameworks, you know, uh, you know, even just developer direction in terms of like how to do things properly. And so, you know, coming from the mobile space, I, I was really familiar with this concept of do not track. And the idea with do not track was that, you know, analytics platforms should be able to interpret, accept and respect a signal when a customer decides that they don't want to be tracked. Right. Or they don't want to be, they want to opt out of data collection or even just poor portions of the data collection. Um, obviously, when you're on a website, it's really just kind of like one type of data collection. When you're dealing with immersive, it's a lot more. It's head position rotation, it's gaze, it's hand controller interactions, it's movement, it's events. So there's a lot of different additional context there that kind of is, uh, you know, spectrums of exposure, you know, that you could potentially have within these environments. And so we felt like it would be a, a really, uh, terrible miss for this industry to not attempt to try to do something. And, you know, we talked to uh, a lot of different folks about it and we ended up creating called something called the XR privacy framework, which you mentioned. And it, it's not really meant to be like, you know, what the XRSI is doing, you know, they've got folks that are really investigating the space, be it building data classification, understanding exposure, presenting it to government, like all those types of things. This was meant to be a technical approach. This was meant to be, here's a tool for a developer to collect consent, right? Be able to break it into all of its core components. And then for the service providers, like Cognitive 3D, to interpret the signal from that framework and turn off data collection to the request of the consumer. So that's kind of the idea here is, is that you'd have a consent pop up, up inside of the application. This developer would like to collect these five data streams for the following purpose. You can turn some of these data streams off. The developer could also opt to say, you know what, without those data streams, maybe in training or something, I can't let you use the experience. That's, you know, it's up to them, right? But they can make that determination with the framework. And then we intercept the signal. The SDK knows how to interpret it and then it turns off the appropriate streams for that particular session. It doesn't send a session at all. So the, that's really kind of the core concept. It was meant to be more of like a technical solution. So we ended up releasing the framework itself, which is like the documentation. We kind of broke down the five categories of data streams. Um, and then we released the Unity and Unreal uh, SDK as well. So you could kind of like easily import a prefab into the project. And that's completely like open and available on... on yeah, I hope people use it. <laughs> You know, so I talk about it whenever I can. We've added it to our documentation. I mean, uh, you heard me on podcasts. I'm talking about it on podcasts and stuff like that. You know, ideally, you know, the OEMs will come up with some sort of strategy that either mirrors this or uh, respects it, you know, something along those lines. But we didn't really want to wait, you know, to kind of see if something would happen. Maybe maybe folks will pay attention to this and, and decide to, to build something. Um, I, I would like to point out, though, um, and I think I did on the on that other podcast, Robot Spaceship, um, that, uh, you know, for all the flack that Meta takes, they actually have a developer data use policy uh, that actually out outlines in, you know, great detail what you can and can't use data for, you know, and it, you know, across the board from, you know, the eye tracking to the whole bit. And, um, you know, when they introduced eye tracking with the Quest Pro, um, you know, I was happy to see that they had app level consent. They've added it to the app review process. So if you actually access that API, it's very much like Android where it's like, okay, you know, if you want to use this API, you need to describe like how you're going to use it and how you're going to store the data and all those types of things. Those controls were there from the ground up. So, you know. Uh, regardless of the fact that, that Meta takes a little bit of kudos to Meta, um, primarily because they've actually, you know, taken several steps forward on trying to get some things wrapped around this stuff. 
Interesting. Yeah, no, great note on meta there, but in general, just incredible that you're creating that XR privacy framework and that you allowed everyone to use it by releasing it on GitHub like that. Cause it's, yeah, yeah it's definitely such an important thing. And like you said, hopefully it is something that some OEMs or somebody can uh, maybe reference, or at least they're building mm-hmm. something similar. Or, or other service providers like us. Like if we have other analytics platforms, maybe they'll, they'll use it. Like we didn't drop branding on it. We dropped it as an MIT license. So mm-hmm. people want to pick it up and start making contributions for it. Like, let's go. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And diving into that a little bit more, I know uh, we've had customers ask us about like, why do we have to be so concerned about data in the future of this? And like, I know one of the examples that I've heard time and time again is if in the future we could track your eyes and the way that you move, and maybe there's a way that doctors can look at that and try to understand how you might be predisposed to a certain disease down the road, an insurance company could use that data to say, we're going to charge you more money because that could possibly be, you could possibly be predisposed to X, Y, or Z disease down the road. Are there any other like, major like examples or things that come to your mind of like why that data could be or how that data could be used wrongly and why it's so important to have a standard or a framework like that yeah for sure i mean for me i i know too much about the data that i, I kind of have a bit of a, a jaded view on this i mean if we think about eye tracking data alone when we think about trying to identify med- medical conditions and those types of elements We're talking about more advanced uses of eye tracking. So you get into things like pupillometry and those types of situations. Um, You also get into um, uh, precision and frequency, which are kind of also really important. And so what I mean by that is like an eye tracker alone at 10 hertz, so like 10 frames a second or something like that, isn't necessarily diagnostic in nature like an eye tracker at 200 hertz would be you know, or something like that. And so we as a company at Cognitive, we just don't collect that data. We collect at a much lower rate to provide inference, you know, to kind of like show you, you know, generally what somebody might've looked at and and for how long, but we don't get at that level of precision where you would move into the diagnostic category. Um, Toby is also, you know, they're the premier eye tracking, um, you know, hardware provider, as well as the software and technology they own hundreds of patents they built really great technology um they've kind of broken their eye tracking into two different categories kind of the base level access to gaze vectors and things like that things that you would need to be able to interpret and and make things like foveated you know rendering work but if you want access to their higher end apis that allow you to get into diagnostics around medical conditions uh you know we've seen some like eye tracking conditions we've seen adhd therapies we've seen all sorts of different types of things you're out, you're accessing their full frequency precision APIs. And, you know, you do that with a license and the license has controls wrapped around it. So um, it is worth kind of thinking through that, you know, the eye tracking hardware companies are thinking about this as well. The Some of the hardware providers that are implementing this technology are thinking about data use and how that data can be used. Uh, a lot of folks will, you know, point out, well, Meta's going to use my eye tracking data for, you know, um, for nuts, you know, or something like that, you know, specifically, uh, disallowed in the data use policy. Um, so, you know, it, it's, you know, arguably, yeah, maybe they could change these things in the future, but you know, it's a good posture to start off with for sure. For sure. You know, really yeah. interesting to hear about Toby as well. I didn't know that they had those two tiers. Uh, like yeah. It's called Aukerman is the brand name of the, okay. of the kind of the more advanced APIs. And, uh, that gives you access to the pupillometry and other types of elements as well. Those are types of things that we don't, we don't collect. Um, if you were using something like Occam you would, you would get access to those. And those is where you can get into really kind of like diagnostic, uh, elements against stimuli, that sort of thing. Right. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Um, in doing further research about cognitive and, and I think seeing some of your posts uh, on LinkedIn or just cognitive posts on LinkedIn, I saw that, um, almost a year ago now, I guess like 10 months ago or so, you announced that you raised $2.5 million in investment uh, for Cognitive. Curious, what have, if you can share anything, what are kind of some of like the biggest uh, innovations or changes that you've made with Cognitive over that past 10 months or so? Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we're definitely kind of in the trenches, you know, living on a ramen budget, you know, and, and trying to build innovative, innovative technology. So I think that the team that, sticked it out with me and I've, I've still have two members of my team that have been with me for seven years now. 
um, you know, and, you know, we're building an innovative product in a really interesting category and they've really stuck it out and believed in that mission. I think that with the investment round, um, it came at the right time. If we had taken it earlier on in the life cycle, we'd probably be dead because we would have been forced to kind of make a decision on either raising more money, scaling down, and then obviously you get into a really toxic type of environment when you try to do stuff like that. Um, but we're really lucky to find our lead investors, which is called Convoy Ventures. Um, they've been incredible partners to us. You know, like they they came in and the majority of typical VCs, there's a little bit of explanation that needs to occur around the technology, how it works, game engines, those types of things. And you can usually tell on a VC call if you're explaining Unity to them you know, or something like that, the things are probably not going to work out if they're not that deep into the into the weeds yet. But with Convoy, you know, these are game focused investors, they understand the entire ecosystem, they're interested in infrastructure, technology and tools. And so, you know, I didn't have to kind of go, go down that path, it was really more around under helping them understand how we could leverage tools like Unity and Unreal to extract, uh, extract spatial insights. And so they really got our thesis it matched up well with theirs and so it kind of worked out to be kind of a, a great match between us and them uh, and then we were able to kind of quickly round out the rest of the round with other folks that i had been building relationships with but in terms of how the company changed we went from five full-time employees now we're 15. um so the right. team has gr grown significantly um and uh, on top of that, just just general maturity, you know, of, of the overall organization. You know, there's a lot of things that were on our list that, you know, we weren't able to get to. The roadmap was out of control, you know, in terms of like the things that, you know, we needed to get done and to meet consumer needs. But the reality was, is that we had a five, six year head start and like core technology, core foundations to build on top of. So uh, when we got that funding, we started building up the team. Uh, we did some of our technical maturity and posture stuff. So we did like a pen test. We got SOC 2 certified, um, which is kind of like a data security framework and things like that. These are things that I take seriously. We wanted to make sure we posture well to customers. And then we landed two Fortune 50s um, inside that inside that year as well on, on huge, huge contracts, the biggest of my uh, of my career. Um, so, you know, that's been it's been a really good journey so far for us. And um you know, you know, we're onto the onto the next steps. We're we're scaling. We got a new dashboard deployed. We launched premium, um, and uh, yeah, happy to talk about games and uh, consumer facing apps if you'd like to. Amazing, yeah, yeah, yeah. First of all, congrats on yeah landing it and finding the right partner there, and yeah, from what you said, doing it at the right time, and then as well landing two Fortune fifty companies. That's incredible, incredible. But yeah, would would love to hear about the gaming side, obviously. Uh, uh, I play a lot of VR games and like you said, you kind of started in the VR game space and then had to pivot and now it sounds like you're getting back into it. Yeah, for sure. I, you know, I think that one of the things that we realized is that, you know, we're building a very general use analytics platform, very similar to like a, like an amplitude or mixed panel, you know, or, or something similar to that, but for the immersive technology category. And so you know, while we had to make a pivot, you know, into the uh, into the enterprise, get into training, simulation, consumer research, and academic research, um, wasn't necessarily the original intent, but intent, but a blessing in disguise. You know, in terms of uh, the maturity that the tools have gone under, like addressing the academic category, just being a big maturity thing for us as well, and making sure that our data is, is resilient, um, and. Uh, so we kind of went down this path of like, you know, building all of this really great, you know, core technology that is better suited now to address the consumer category, consumer facing apps. And for that, it can be games, entertainment or other types of non games applications as well. And so, you know, we as part of the convoy round decided that that's something that we wanted to add back into our go to market. Um, you know, we kind of went down this path of deciding that we were going to continue to provide a fantastic service to enterprises because because we know we can generate six and seven figure contracts and, and licensing from those categories um, in, in licensing. Um, and, uh, you know, we can go ahead and make this product much more generally available and, and monetize the outliers, right? So like look for the opportunities where we can provide value, but also provide value to the uh, industry at large. 
And so um, with all of that said, we launched a freemium product. I think we did that back half last year. Um, the freemium product's been doing great. We're getting signups every single day. A new developer's coming on the platform. We're super generous. We give 100,000 sessions per developer. And if somebody, if you're somebody building apps in the space, you know that that's not a small amount of sessions just in terms of where we are as a category, uh, but also provides a lot of value. And, you know, we came to it with a thesis as well when we built the da new dashboards. Um, one of the things that we've heard a lot in these kind of seven years of being in this space is that um, the OEMs are, are also realizing that they have a material stake in, in quality. And so what I mean by that is that when you start thinking about um, content quality, the surface area of building high quality content is actually pretty large for a developer in terms of the things that they need to address and uh, the things that they need to target to build comfortable, immersive, performant assets and stimuli. And so, um, you know, what we realized from that is that you, you know, there is uh, a risk of attrition, churn, uh, for the developer in building low quality content, but there's also a risk of attr attrition for the platform itself, meaning that I might take my quest um, and put it back in the box or let it collect dust, you know, or something like that um, because, you know, I had a poor experience inside the headset. And so what we tried to do with the new dashboards is provide three new core metrics that were all driven around quality. Uh, we've got comfort, presence and performance. And we basically leverage the data pipeline we've already created to drive those three metrics. You can upload your asset to Cognitive 3D for free. You install the SDK and we'll give you your numbers for the, your particular asset, as well as a breakdown. So you can filter the data and do all sorts of different things with it. Look at the data from different devices, look at it from different scenes and be able to see where you should spend time as a developer to build a higher quality asset. Uh, beyond that, it also provides a barometer, right? So you have that ability to see like where you stand uh, in each of these three categories, but also where you stand in the category, right? So if uh, all the other training applications or all the other games in this particular category, you know, where do I stand among their scores as well? Where do I need to make improvements to build a higher quality application? And so that's kind of the where we where we took uh, the the consumer and, and gaming focused product, and then we license folks into Pro, which gives them access to the broader tools and the and the deeper levels of insight. Okay, amazing, amazing. Yeah. And yeah. how is that that uptick been over the? You said you released it at the back half of last year, early this year. Yeah, how's it been so far? Really good. We've got some great partners. We're starting to see larger scale applications using the product as well, which is really helpful. Uh, we just hired Dr. Nicholas Anderson from, um, oh, I don't want to miss mistake or uh, university. I think she was UBC. UBC or SFU. Oh, oh, I'm getting in trouble for this. Um, anyway, so um, she uh, she's your background's in cognitive sciences and cognitive psychology. And, um, you know, we've been really analyzing all of that raw data to be able to figure out how do we build better metrics? How do we build better scores? So it's actually been like a really exciting time in the company right now where we're getting, you know, we're taking away layers of the onion here and figuring out how to make these metrics more in depth, more capable, more scalable, uh, easier for developers to understand. Uh, so use a developer to focus on building great content. We can provide you insight on what, what you need to do to kind of tweak that saying okay and looking at the partners that you have right now i don't know how, how much vr gaming you do yourself but is there a partner out there that you see in the the vr game space that you would love to work with if there was like one game that's either your favorite game or you would just be really interested in like seeing the analytics be behind that uh, I, I don't know. I don't want to name any names. I would say that you know goals for me as an organization we'd like to see a good portion of the top 20 uh, using the platform, I feel like it adds better vali validity between the behind the metrics as well. Um, the other thing is to say we're a growing organization, right? So you know, for us, we do recognize that input and the scores themselves can potentially be delineated based off of um, the category or the type of application that you're using. And so what I mean by that is like, you know, if I only have a few applications in a certain category, it's hard to build a machine learned score, you know, or something along those lines with so much 
uh, so little input data for that specific category. So the way we've kind of structured it is that we've got a kind of few top level categories. And then as we grow those categories, then we break them when we get to critical mass into subcategories. And then the metrics get more precise with more data. So that's kind of what the, the, the path that we're taking right now. Okay. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, to switch gears a little bit, we were talking about education. So how do you see VR or XR in general impacting education over the next five, 10 years, let's say? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's super exciting. I, I learn best by doing. I think that most people feel the same way about that. So I do feel like immersive tech gives us superpowers uh, in our ability to, to learn and, and take on new skills. I don't think we're at the point where uh, you know, Neo is loading new programs and he's going to be able to fly the helicopter. But, uh, you know, I, I do think it is an opportunity for us to take um, complicated skill sets that are normally restrictive and not accessible in nature and make them much more accessible and and, uh, and more broadly available. So I, I am really excited that I, I think that for most complex skill sets that immersive technology is probably the best answer. I think it would create um, ubiquity and accessibility in access to knowledge, um, even broader than uh, Udemy or you know other types of learning tools and the ability to to try and, and do, as opposed to just simply learn and watch. So I, I, I'm excited about kind of the spatial future moving forward. I think that you know five ten years from now, you know seems close to me now that I'm already seven years into this one, but. You know, I, I think that these are going to make their way into more classrooms, into more universities. Um, I still think that there's challenges that need to be solved in content creation. Um, educators need to be able to easily create content and, and be able to, you know, make it available really quickly. Um, so I think that there's still challenges there. But those are those are kind of my, my thoughts on that. I couldn't agree more. And I guess that was going to be my next question was what what are you looking at as kind of the the main pieces or challenges that need to be solved to get XR to mass adoption in the education space? Do you think it really comes down to that that kind of like PowerPoint of XR to allow, uh, quote unquote, to allow teachers to create their own experiences or what other challenges would you say? Yeah, I mean, it used to be that, you know, headset cost was the primary driver, quality of experience was a primary driver on things like the the headset's capabilities, you know, like what it could do and making people sick and stuff like that. I mean, uh, we've been around long enough that the issues have changed over time of, you know, what we were concerned about, you know, then and, and what we're concerned about now. So I think that that cost of headset, cost of technology is going to keep dropping, which will make it more accessible. I think that the, that, that key area, though, of making that content creation process much easier, um, you know, maybe, uh, you know, AI driven or, G chat GPT driven content creation or other types of asset generation and things like that would make this stuff a lot easier um, to to adopt and build. Um, but I think that tools like that are, are probably the biggest obstacle on on greater adoption at this point. And then plus the deployment and stuff like that, it has to be easy, right? Like you have to be able to like build it. I see it in front of me in the screen or I see it in front of me in the headset. Now I need to make it go on those 30 headsets and it can't be a huge thing where you know, at the start of class, you spend 30 minutes on debug, you know, trying to get this stuff working, right? Yeah. Oh, for sure. For sure. Yeah. And yeah, no, I couldn't agree more there on the, the deployment side of things. Uh, and then, yeah, I think uh, you make a really good point on the AI side of things, because I know you were talking about soft skills there. And that's something that we face where we're creating mm -hmm. a soft skill simulation and we have to script everything out. Then we have to get voice actors to, to record everything. Then we're going back and forth with our client, whereas now we're starting to test out AI and have AI conversations and it's like, just fill out one page of background information on that character. And now you have an AI that you can have a full conversation with and it's ready to yeah. go. So it get, gives that power back to a teacher who can create those characters quickly. Yeah, super interesting. I mean, we've, we've even seen the same issues in kind of the commercial category as well, um, outside academia and in corporate training. I mean... Um, there's lots of folks that are building really great content out there and they'll try to build general use contact, uh, content like a, you know, um, confined space or forklift simulator, or those types of things. But then you have, 
equipment changes, equipment variations. You've got, you know, uh, confined space looks contextually different. The tools are different, you know, all these different things. And, you know, if these, if people are going to learn by doing, they need to learn and do within the process that the company expects. And so that's also been a challenge in that, you know, folks are trying to create scalable modules that people can just use. But the reality is, is that they do need to be a little bit different for each, you know, a uh, different company or each different institution, depending on the learning outcomes that they're after as well. For sure. And, yeah. And this next question ties in there because um, I think it's what everyone pictures of that scalable uh, future. Uh, but every time I ask this question, I get different answers. So I'm curious, what do you think of the metaverse? What is the metaverse in your mind? Uh, yeah, I think I've heard you comment on. You it probably before. talk. I've heard me talk about yeah. this before. I talk about it at AWE. I like spent like the first five minutes of my talk kind of <laughs> slamming this concept. I mean, honestly, you know, I think it's kind of uh, the terminology would be a, the equivalent of the internet, you know, as we see it today, right? And you know, I kind of talked about it in my AWE presentation a little bit as well. You know, we didn't call the internet the internet in the beginning. We called it uh, AOL. We called it a value proposition that people understood that answered or solved the particular problem that consumers were trying to solve. And eventually over time, the technical capabilities of that and the open web and, you know, the ability to navigate to different web pages and do different things became, you know, more available, more accessible. We saw search engines become incredibly popular and some of the most valuable companies in the world. Um, because of this ability to, to interconnect these different things together. And I think that that's the reality of the metaverse as well. The metaverse is really just kind of these fundamental technologies, the ability to fundamentally embody yourself within that world and my ability to connect to these different places within the metaverse in a seamless way. And so we're not going to be there until that exists. And so calling things the metaverse, sure. You know, maybe it's a, a piece, a piece, but it's uh, on an island by itself. It's like having a computer locked in the basement, not connected to the internet, but you put a web page on it uh, and you're able to look at just that web page and you can't do anything else with it. Right. So that that's kind of, you know, that, that in the early days of the internet, I think it would just be kind of like that university intranet versus, you know, the interconnection of the internet. That's a great analogy way to look at it. I, I also always say like it's the next version of the internet, but looking at the yeah computer in a basement locked away and the academic intranet. And that's, <laughs> I love that. Um, thinking about that, like further, do you think that it is going to be a company like Meta or somebody like that, that does end up building that framework, that next search engine uh, of the metaverse or whatever we end up calling it? Or do you think it's going to be more of a multiple companies coming together on like a certain standard or a specific standard that's set? I don't know. I'm not sure yet. You know, I think that interaction with web and mobile has been relatively faceless, um, you know, and you're not necessarily embodying anybody, you know, or, or having any sort of presence within these environments as a passive use as opposed to active participant use, as we kind of talked about earlier. So, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, somebody will probably build the underlying technology of high quality avatars that people will want to use. I, you know, ideally it'll be a standard and there'll be many providers, you know, and these things are interop, but you know, the, the way, you know, it, it, private and public companies operate, you know, people want to win. Yes. And so we'll have to kind of see how that ultimately shakes out. Um, but, uh, for, for now, I think that that's kind of yet to be seen. I think that the interconnections, those are going to have to be standards. I think that there's a whole bunch of challenges on streaming that need to be solved, uh, to make the metaverse more likely and more ubiquitous, even just like making applications just in time available on the headset, maybe WebXR is a solution to that problem as well. Um, but, uh, it is going to take some significant work to kind of get to that, that promised land of getting off the intranet. <laughs> for sure for sure yeah and looking at that future as well um we, we talked about ai we were talking about biometrics and how you're you've been working with those for um, multiple biometric devices for a while now curious looking at that future or looking at the the near future what do you think or what are you exploring right now in like kind of those those next piece of software whether it's ai or it's things like bci or 
any accessories like gloves or um, cat VR with their treadmills or things along those lines? Are there any that you're really looking at right now, either personally or as cognitive 3D, that's kind of like that next step of uh, on the, I guess, accessory or yeah software side so on the input side it's really kind of uh transparent to us it doesn't really matter how you input how you're going to move through the world mm -hmm. i mean maybe we could provide better visibility of how the treadmill is being used or if you've got haptics being able to provide some debug or some better visibility on the haptic feedback that was provided to the end user so the developer could use that but these are really just kind of like indications as opposed to fundamental change for us the, the biometrics and the eye tracking thing is always really interesting. You know, I was asked by somebody who doing doing a piece on Apple about, you know, kind of the the concept of eye tracking and, a, you know, a consumer focused device, or at least that's what it looks like right now. And, you know, I don't really see this stuff as that important on consumer facing applications. You know, the things that are important are still spatial in nature, but precision eye tracking is really not a material problem that you need to solve to be able to understand where somebody turned their head and what they look at. There's gaze inputs and other types of things that you can do as well. And there's even academic papers around, you know, gaze estimation, you know, and being able to use, you know, head position rotation velocity to be able to extrapolate to like, you know, 95% accuracy of like what the user was intending to look at when they turn their head. So there's lots of different ways that you can kind of go down this path without necessarily getting into biometrics and like, you know, capturing someone's actual eye. Um, so I don't think it's actually that much important on the on the um, on the consumer facing app side. But on commercial apps, you know, if I'm going to assess a police officer on situational awareness before taking action or, you know, choosing lethal, non-lethal action uh, in a particular scenario, I might want precision in that type of scenario to be able to understand, like, did the user comprehend or did the end user comprehend, um, you know, what was going on in that environment before taking that action? Same thing applies to the pilots and, you know, um, uh, you know, situational awareness in those situations too. Um, you know, processes and sequential processes are very important in those types of environments. If you have a cabin depressurization or something like that, you may have a very specific, you know, emergency process you need to follow as a pilot. Um, to ensure the safety of the aircraft. And so, you know, eye tracking and like what they actually looked at on a very precise uh, panel of instruments might be a really material thing that you need to assess to be able to understand and, and comprehend performance um, in that particular case. On the biometric side, it's kind of, kind of interesting. You know, a lot of folks uh, ask us about biometrics, but in terms of like folks that actually use it, not as much, you know, we're actually doing the most biometrics that we're doing is, you know, we're using our own sensor APIs now to measure the uh, IMU and stuff like that on, on more readable terms that we can, um, you know, start building uh, some of these like comfort scores and uh, some of these other scores uh, against as well. We really haven't seen like heart rate and galvanic skin response and stuff like that it escape academia. Um, it's typically academic folks that are interested in these types of inputs, these types of standards. It's very unlikely a commercial customer says, hey, I want to measure my employees with a biometric. It's really just not not all that popular and not really a, a commercial need at this time. So um, we do support academia because they're building the papers, the underlying input that might drive our decisions moving for forward in the future, not just as cognitive, but as an industry. And I think it's important from that perspective. But it really hasn't been a huge key driver for us. Makes a lot of sense. And I guess it makes sense for enterprise institutions where if you're scaling that out to multiple employees to have to buy any devices, extra devices on top of the headset for heart yeah. rate or galvanic skin response, it gets quite expensive. So Quest, Quest, Quest 1, Pico 2, Pico 3, um, Quest 2. These are game changers, right? Like these are huge. You know, we, we thought it really wasn't that big of a deal you know like we came from gear vr you know it's like where we kind of started and 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 like five og5 you know like way back in the day and that was like that was awesome you know and that's where we started our data collection journey um and then we went all the way onto full pc vr and then we kind of made the shift back to untethered environments um you know commercial customers don't want to add accessories they want this stuff to be unattended you know they want people to just be able to throw it on and use it and so, you know, it, it requiring accessories, setup, configuration, um, uh, like uh, uh, calibration, those types of things, these are just all additional steps that create friction. 
right? So, you know, what we're trying to do is ride the capabilities of the headset because that's going to get the products used. For sure. And see, we're, we're coming up on, uh, on time here. So I have these like rapid fire questions, but one question I forgot to ask before we go into those, um, talking about education, thinking back to your education, whether it's K-12 or your university career, is there a simulation that you wish would have been available to, to you for any topic? Just out of curiosity. Yeah. Wow. That's a great, that's a great, uh, great question. Um, I used to be, and I maybe I still I am a really terrible public speaker. And, uh, you know, I, I remember some of the first kind of business presentations I gave at my last startup and just freezing and sweating profusely on stage and all that kind of stuff. Um, and just completely locking up. Um, yeah, I wish Ovation and other types of tools like that were around, you know, back then. And uh, that would have been a really great superpower to make a good first impression. Um, you know, but I think that that's been kind of a uh, an important thing, um, you know, that a lot of folks are finding value from. Other general use education stuff, I'm not I'm not super sure. I think that that would, that would be probably be my biggest one. And I think that a human's ability to communicate effectively is a superpower. So uh, that one, that one's important. Well, you couldn't notice it now. You, watching even your AWE speech, which I believe was six, seven years ago or so, the one that I was mm -hmm. watching at least, uh, mm -hmm. couldn't notice it at all. So you, you definitely got the experience you needed in that first startup and awesome. are great now. <laughs> But yeah, well, since we're in the, the deep end here at the end, going to this rapid fire, basically I'll say just like one or two words and then whatever word comes to your mind first to, to respond with and just curious on uh, your thoughts. And some of these are professional, others not. So we'll uh, jump into it. The first word, pop culture. Pop culture. Oh, man. Uh, ready player one. <laughs> love it, love it. Okay. Uh, conference or conferences. Oh, that was tough. I, I what, what type of conference? Come on. Uh, I, I don't know. AWE is a bit like my favorite of the year. I, I love going to that, that show. There's lots of folks that go, go to it. Um, but there's there's lots of folk, uh, different stuff for different categories. One that I that was new this year that I really enjoyed was uh, MIT Reality Hack. Um, I went to that for the first time, and that was pretty cool. Watching all these young folks as well as the industry folks hack on projects for, for four days. That was pretty cool. That yeah. does sound really cool. Love it. Yeah. Um, this one's going to be another tough one. Unity or Unreal? Oh, oh. Uh, okay, so I'll share an actual piece of data. Um, we do 89% of our business in Unity right now. We do 11% of our business in Unreal uh, from an engine-based breakdown. There are a lot of high-value Unreal apps, though. Um, so think bigger budgets, more developers, you know, those types of things. So sure. you could take that how you like it, but, you know, on the mass of apps, Unity on you know maybe a bigger budget you know uh maybe unreal yeah okay. interesting i love yeah. the answer with the data from cognitive yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um nfts oh scam scam okay <laughs> not 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 a huge fan i mean I, I think that there's definitely use cases there i don't think that they were fig figured out before there was a run on the bank agreed agreed yeah uh we talked about it a little bit uh but the metaverse Hmm. Future. Future. Okay. Yeah. Uh, education. Future. Future. Okay. Favorite book. Oh, uh, I don't know which one I want to tell you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm reading one of my investors books right now. Um, it's, uh, the space economy, uh, by Chad Anderson. Um, he's the managing partner of, um, Space Capital, uh, definitely take a read about that. He talks about kind of the future, <laughs> you know, uh, space technology and stuff like that. Okay, interesting. I'll yeah. have to check yeah. it out. Yeah. Uh, similarly, favorite movie? Oh, man. Do I have to give something that's like relevant to our space? Actually, no, no, yeah, no. okay. <laughs> okay. I'm going to give you an old school one. I really like Hackers. Do you ever watch that movie? I just watched it for the first time like two months ago. It's one of our mentor's <laughs> favorite movies. So love it, love it. <laughs> the only reason I mentioned it is because we were talking about it on Slack the other day. But uh, yeah, it was good. Yeah. But, and last one, um, 
this week or this month's top XR news that you've been watching or interested? Yeah, I mean, it's I'm pro. I would say that we're still kind of like um, uh, not not reeling, but we're still kind of in the um, deep con- contemplative state about how we're going to address you know a- Apple um, Vision Pro kind of moving forward as well. And I think that we'll probably be thinking about that for the next quarter or so, you know, and stuff like that. You know, we'll have to kind of see how things come to fruition and stuff like that. But I mean, this is something that I was waiting for as a founder since when I started this company. And so, <laughs> you know, for me, it's like, that's the news of the year. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. No. Yeah. I have completely all the same board there. I know. Uh, yeah. How many rumors there have been for the past six years? Like, oh, Apple's releasing a headset next quarter. It, <laughs> it's it's doing it's doing exactly what I expected it to. You know, investors have new interest again in the space. Um, OEMs who have been sitting on the side, other than Apple and the other vendors that are actually trying to build headsets, have suddenly come back to life. Um, Apple has set a high bar. They could have did us a terrible disservice if they produced a headset that was like 10 percent of capability you know or if they came off with a slice of technology as opposed to a full-fledged solution they're forcing everybody to continue to up their game and up the quality and experience and uh, i think it was worth the wait we'll just have to see what what it kind of um you know how, how the industry reacts to it ultimately for sure for sure yeah and uh i've got two or yeah two other questions to to wrap it up but before i ask those are there any questions that you wish i would ask anything that i forgot to talk about that you wish uh, we would have chalked up you know what uh xrpf would have been it um i'll just re- recap on it real quick um you know if you are interested in xr privacy and you're building an app or something along those lines uh xrprivacyframework.org uh, is the website you can check out. It is a framework. It's easy to use. We respect it at Cognitive 3D. I don't know of anybody else that's using it yet, but if you're a service provider listening to me talk on this podcast today, um, consider using it. You know, consider asking for permission and you know, sending those signals. Regardless if you're using a supported analytics platform or not, um, you know, I think that it's going to take a lot of service providers as well as a lot of uh, content providers uh, that want to use this uh, for this to become a standard. Amazing. Yeah. Even beyond service providers, I know there's a lot of educators that listen that, uh, have their own teams at their school or are looking into it and like to use those types of frameworks that are ready to go and that they can model off of. So no, great point. Great point. Um, last two questions. Always like to ask who should we have on the podcast next? Anyone that you think would be a great person to talk about these topics? Oh man. You ever talked to Kyle before at um, Tailspin? No, I've not talked with Kyle uh, before. I think I'm connected with him on LinkedIn, but that's about it. Talk to Kyle. Get him on. Okay. okay. Yeah, you mentioned you're interested in soft skills. They're doing some really cool stuff. They've got a product called Copilot. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that one. Interesting stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then the last question, uh, obviously we talked about cognitive a lot, but any current projects or anything that you'd like to, to plug in general? Uh, anything that people should check out or at the very least where should people reach out to you yeah i mean cognitive used to be very expensive and inaccessible and now we're free so if you're interested in trying out cognitive 3d and using it um, there's a good chance you'll be able to use it for a really long time get good value from it um, before we have a commercial discussion and the way we like to have our commercial discussions is that we're having them when you're killing it so um, you know, I think that, uh, if you're interested, cognitive3d.com is a sign up button top right hand corner. Uh, you get full act or well, not full access, but you get access to all of our new dashboards that I talked about today. Incredible. Yeah, definitely yeah. check out cognitive. I know we're running a few experiments with it right now and I'm very excited to, to get to that, that threshold where we can, uh, get, uh, everything else locked in as well. So Tony, thank you so much for being on the Ediverse Enigma podcast and chatting. It was a great conversation and loved hearing your opinion on so many different topics and glad to just uh, get reconnected in general. So thank you. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Evan.